Thank you very much. Welcome back to this uh, last series of lectures. Um, the, there will be very few proofs in these lectures. There will be some fairly honest summaries of proofs, but no, no, uh, not very many accurate proofs. Uh, the plan is to um, try and get to a fairly accurate statement of what's called geometrization theorem during the first hour. And during the second hour, I'll talk about some constructions and, and properties of hyperbolic manifolds, which are a uh, subclass. So I'll start with this rather mundane observation that was known to, to 19th century mathematicians that in dimension two, real dimension two, every um, surface S and by every I mean orientable and compact, closed. Um, is topologically classified by its genus. The genus is a number such that S is homeomorphic to a connected sum of that many uh, copies of the torus. T2 is the torus. And you do connected sums of tori with each other a number of times. Uh, you can also compute G from the fundamental group. It's uh, the rank of the pi 1 of S if you abelianize it and divide by 2. So uh, that is all there is uh, in the world of surfaces. And also it admits a, a um, constant curvature metric modeled on uh, one of the following exactly one, um, the hyperbolic plane, the Euclidean plane, R2, or the sphere, S2. In fact, there's just one example here, the sphere, one example here, the torus, and one example in, I mean, uh, as many examples as genera G uh, are hyperbolic. Okay, so, um, the subject of this, of this talk is how, how, what can we say in this direction about dimension three? And of course, it's much harder. So first, there is no such uh, topological classification, um, not nearly. Um, but Poincaré still ventured a kind of a claim in this direction. So that's called the Poincaré conjecture. Uh, that if um, the fundamental group of your three manifold, so I'm not going to call it S now, but M, as in manifold, M3 for the dimension, is trivial, then uh, M3 has to be homeomorphic to the three sphere. Again, M is, a, is a, an orientable closed three manifold. Um, and as I was saying, the, a reasonable classification of, um, of such three manifolds is, let's say, hard, but we are, uh, here are two statements. First connected sum is still our friend, namely the, um, there is a unique unique um, prime decomposition holds in dimension three. 
So prime decomposition means connected sums into things that are no longer connected sums of other things. That is like for integer numbers. Um, uh, uh, amount. So uh, it exists, it's unique, and that, that's already far from easy. <coughs> you can have it by combining results of Knazer in, I think, the 30s, and later results by Milner. So in a sense, it's, it's enough to uh, uh, understand prime three manifolds. And about prime manifolds, here's what we can say. A, a prime three manifold has a unique um, so that's isotopically unique. Um, minimal decomposition by incompressible tori So those are tori T2 that find themselves injected in them um, in a way that's also injective at the pi 1 level. So if there are such tori, then you can cut along them and what, uh, what's left at the end is essentially unique um, into pieces that are uh, either Atoroidal, meaning no uh, incompressible uh, T2 any longer, or ciphered fibered. So I'm going to say now what, what ciphered fibered manifolds are. Uh, this was the, the first class of three manifolds that can be said to have been well, well understood. So Ciphered fibered. Uh, three manifolds. Well, the first well understood class by Ciphered in the 40s. Oh, and by the way, this, uh, this second statement about Tori is due to JSJ, that's a very common uh, way of calling it, JCO, I'm going to use it, uh, JCO, Charlen, and independently Johansson. Uh, I think it's one N double S, but don't trust me. Um, okay, so <coughs> the ciphered fiber manifolds are the ones that are um, is ciphered fiber. If M comes with a partition, into circles, such that um, all but finitely many of these circles lie at the center of a solid torus. So, our, so that means that the nearby uh, circles just travel along the same circle and close up at the same time it does. Our uh, cores of S1 cross uh, B2, the ball cross the circle. So just think of it as you have fibered your, your uh, cylinder into segments and you close up. 
uh, the remaining ones uh, or the exceptional fibers being modeled on um, so S and I'm going to draw the picture first you do the same vibration of the cylinder into segments but you close up with some fraction of a turn um, so uh, B2 cross 0 1 modulo X1 is the same as uh, E to the I so I need to really keep track of the of the rational number that I put here k over n 2 pi uh, x 0 so I have to I subdivide into n uh, segments here and I identify the uh, uh, this point the point number 0 with point number k <coughs> the color maybe as a result, the fibers away from the core have to, have to travel n times before they close up, travel along the cylinder n times, wh while the central fiber is, uh, travels only once. And you put which exponent of e, the primitive, the standard primitive roots of unity or any roots of unity? Is it, uh, what did you write, the pi, pi? Uh, the sign does matter the sign of, of k over n so k is in z modulo n z um, okay so um, there is a full classification of those these are fully classified The space of fibers is a two-dimensional thing that's really an orbifold, right? If you, if you travel inside the space of fibers, there are two dimensions worth of ways of perturbing your fiber, and sometimes it becomes singular, and, and that means the, this two-dimensional space does something weird. It's in fact an orbifold, is a two dimensional orbifold um, namely it's modeled on R2 and R2 modulo uh, an order n I rotation or an order n, uh, let's call it n sub s. This n sub s being one of the being the, the n that we see here. So there's one n sub s for each singular fiber. So the orbifold forgets about the k, about the numerator, but it knows how many times the fibers fold. And so the, this orbifold kind of forgets part of the data. We still have to put back the data in, and <coughs> the, the the numerator data. And there's a whole calculus of these things sometimes uh, a, a space can have several uh, orbifold realization uh, sorry several ciphered fiber realizations and the, the calculus of these things is well understood so when you cut by the in incompressible torah you get something is boundary and is it part of the cipher is the cipher same with the boundary or not this torus here no it's just a local model so, so uh, i'm just saying that there's an there's a um, an atlas whose charts would be just tori and with, with a solid tori with a compatibility condition when they are doing it. No, I'm asking about the pieces in this JSJ thing. We yes. have by incompressible tori. Right, so, so there's, there's a, a version of all of this with boundary. And when, the, when there's a, a torus in the boundary, in the JSJ uh, business, this torus will be itself foliated by uh, uh, circles of the, of the cipher vibration. Um, all right. 
uh, this two-dimensional orbifold has a, an, uh, so let, let's call it O, with an orbifold Euler characteristic. Um, and there's a way of computing this. It's just the Euler characteristic of the underlying surface of O. If you forget that the singular points are singular, you just have a topological surface in front of you. Call this <coughs> uh, well, O between bars. And you have to do something for each singular fiber, namely you subtract 1 minus uh, 1 over Ns, over, the, the, over all the singular fibers. So this is a number that, that, that makes sense uh, uh, to measure. Uh, it, it will show up a little bit later in the, in the statement of geometrization. Now, uh, here are some examples of ciphered fibered spaces. It's of course perfectly okay to have no singular fibers, like in the surface of genus G cross a circle. Or maybe the surface of genus G uh, then take the unit tangent bundle, T1. That's also fine. And also, you can look at a lens, what's called a lens space. So L sub, I put a fraction here, lens space. And that's uh, by definition S3 modulo, so S3 is seen as the unit sphere in, in R4, modulo the action of uh, R2 uh, pi over n rotation matrix and uh, sorry, B, uh, let me use A, 2 pi over A and R uh, 2b pi over a. Where r theta is the rotation matrix. Right, you act on S3 by such a, a, a composition of rotations and the quotient is in fact a smooth manifold. Uh, that comes with a ciphered fiber structure, in fact, with many ciphered fiber structures. And uh, there's a question about this in your exercise sheet. Okay. Um, now, in, um, in 1980, Thurston proposed, so I'm going to uh, give it as a, de a you know, definition, a theorem, and a conjecture. I'm going to state all of these. I'm going to take me a few blackboards. First, uh, the definition the um, a model geometry <coughs> is a simply connected manifold since we work in three dimensions let's say a three manifold X with a smooth action transitive by a Lie group G such that um, stabilizers G sub X are compact 
no larger group in the sense of inclusion um, acts with compact stabilizers. And also, the, uh, there should exist, so to, to rule out some, some cases which are not of interest for us, there should exist a compact quotient of the form uh, gamma under x uh, for gamma in G discrete. You mean no larger group acts faithfully, otherwise you can just take product of this. What do you mean no larger group acts? Uh, well, by diffeomorphisms. You can take the group and add a compact factor that acts trivially, so it's... Oh, right, right. It's, uh... Thank you. Um, now, conspicuously, there is no uh, metric in this, uh, in this definition. Uh, and that's, that's on purpose. Namely, um, you, you could put a metric on x that's invariant under the action. By compactness, you can take a metric and then average it. By compactness of the stabilizers, x carries a G invariant metric, possibly not unique. So, uh, for example, I'm going to give examples, in fact, the full list of model geometries in a moment. But for example, um, uh, if you take for X the what's called SL2 tilde, which is also the unit tangent bundle uh, of H2, well, universal cover of that, um, then the, the, the and G, uh, yes, and G equals the, the same, well, G equal, So this is the x. Um, so what I'm talking about is what if I, if I want to put a metric on this x, is how do I measure the, the distance between two unit tangent vectors to the hyperbolic plane? I want to travel <coughs> um, from this unit tangent vector to that unit tangent vector, and let's say that traveling Carrying it over along a segment by parallel transport costs me some price in euros, proportional to the distance. And uh, so I add this up along the, the path that I choose to travel. And uh, rotating as I go costs me some other amount of, uh, of uh, at this time in dollars, Canadian dollars, I guess. Um, uh, and, and what matters is the combined cost to define the, the distance between the two points. How, how much do I? Uh, have to pay in the base, and how much do I have to pay in terms of rotating my vector? And uh, the actual geodesics will depend on the rate change between euros and dollars. So the, the, the geodesics of these metrics do not look the same. Uh, so these are different metrics on the same manifold. But for our definition, it's still the same model geometry. Um, okay, now uh, the theorem is that There exist exact eight, exactly eight model geometries uh, namely, so I'm going to start with the constant curvature ones, H3, so that this looks very similar to the, the two-dimensional classification that we had at the, at the beginning. H3 
R3, S3. Um, and in those cases, the dimension of G is always 6. The isometry group of hyperbolic 3 space is 6 dimensional. And then there are the, the product geometries, so H2 cross R, S2 cross R. So these are self-explanatory. You let the, the group uh, of isometries of, of H2 act and you also allow yourself to travel along the, the second factor. So that's a four-dimensional um, group of isometries. There's also the one I gave here, SL2 Twiddle, and something called nil geometry, about which I will say more towards the end of this lecture. So th for those, uh, dimension of G equals 4. And the last one called solve geometry, G dimension of G equals 3. Um, so the two that I have not really explained are the last two, and there will be pictures and uh, explanations about them uh, at the end of this lecture, if I'm lucky. Um, and also, for us, a geometric structure on M is a diffeomorphism to um, uh, a space of the form gamma under X for gamma in one of those Gs. So now the conjecture. So this was a conjecture uh, of about 1980, and it was in fact proved. It's the geometrization uh, theorem by Perelman. in about 90, uh, 2002. Uh, so it says the following. If M is uh, oriented, compact, prime, um, then the JSJ pieces Mi of M have um, all have finite volume geometric structures. So oh, over a GI XI, where uh, it may depend on the piece. Uh, more precisely, and I think, I think I'm going to use a wi white blackboard for the more precisely part. I mean the uh, what's left when you remove those uh, those tori, those subsurfaces. So those are submanifolds with boundaries, and uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean the interior. You, you remove the boundaries. Um, more precisely. If, so let's, let's go, if pi 1 of m is finite, and just to be fancy, I'm going to call this 
virtually trivial. <laughs> Then um, xi, the model, equals uh, S3. So you see how this uh, generalizes the Poincaré conjecture that was here. It says the, uh, if pi1 is trivial, then, X, uh, then mi is the sphere S3. Uh, otherwise, if pi1 of m is virtually uh, cyclic, then the model has to be S2 cross R. Uh, do you mean pi 1 of mi? Pi 1 of mi, thank you. And the, the corresponding model is called xi. Uh, if not, but it is still virtually abelian, then we are are dealing with Euclidean gen geometry, so I think I'd call it R3. If not, but it's still virtually nilpotent, and we're dealing with the mysterious nil geometry. If not, but we're still virtually uh, solvable, then it has to be solved geometry. I've, I'm through five of them. If not, then uh, the discussion becomes uh, twofold. So if there exists an exact sequence Um, defining, so the kernel is Z, the group the sequence defines is a uh, finite index subgroup of pi 1 of m, of m i. So if, uh, if there virtually exists such a, a, an exact sequence, then two cases may arise. If mi is compact, meaning mi is in fact the only piece. Whenever I had to, to cut along something, since I had to remove the boundary, that, that, that means the, it's not, not compact. So if it's compact, um, then uh, if the exact sequence splits, Uh, then the model space has to be uh, H2 cross R. If not, Xi has to be the SL2 twiddle metric, like on, like on the unit tangent bundle of a surface. If Mi is not compact, Uh, then both geometries actually can live on the on the manifold in question. Uh, so that means uh, both xi, I don't have to choose, both uh, xi equal SL2 twiddle and H2 cross R are valid. Um, I'm going to say a, a, a little bit more about how, how this can happen. Uh, but the remaining case, so if there is no such sequence. So what does compact and not compact mean here? Mi was obtained from a, a, a compact manifold, a closed manifold, by uh, cutting it along some surfaces. So if I had to cut at all, then the pieces are not compact. I, I've removed something. If I have not, then it is still compact. So that's really. That's really uh, a matter of whether I had to cut or not. And the splitting is up to finite index again, or, or just splitting? Uh, the splitting is an actual splitting here. Um, yeah. 
Uh, and when you say both are valid, does it mean both at the same time? Yes, I can put two different geometries, two different finite volume geometries on the same uh, manifold, and I'm going to say how this happens in a, after I'm done with the statement. So in the remaining case, so if there is no such exact sequence, in the remaining case, which is also the case where um, pi 1 of m, uh, well, mi is irreducible a toroidal irreducible <coughs> with pi, uh, with uh, infinite fundamental group then xi is hyperbolic <coughs> so i'm going to add some more uh, little things to this uh, discussion. One is that in those five cases um, automatically uh, mi is compact uh, namely m equals mi no, no cutting uh, And the other thing is that observation um, quotients of models other than H3 and Sol are ciphered fibered. And cipher fibered means really well understood. So in fact, if I do this in orange, then there is a uh, a discussion to be had. In these cases, the Euler characteristic of the I mean the orbifold characteristic of the base of the ciphered fibered space is positive. In the next two is zero. In these two, it's negative. Um, so all, all of these six cases are really uh, well classified, they are ciphered. Uh, the remaining case, other than hyperbolic, the solved case, is, is also um, uh, also has a nice property, which is Okay, what is the solved manifold? The isometry group, the trivial connected component of the isometry group of Sol is just you act affinely on R3 by matrices of the form um, e to the t, e to the minus t in the first two coordinates And the translation should be by t uh, in the third coordinate. And here you put whatever you like. Right, so this is, uh, this is really R semi-direct R2, where R acts on R2 by, by compressing, and, and, uh, compressing one direction and stretching the other. So the picture to be had in mind is you have let's say, a little square in the first two directions. And here's a square that's isometric to it. it. Looks like a rectangle up here. And if I push it down there, it looks like a rectangle with the other aspect ratio. And everything in the way of horizontal translations is good. So that, that's, a, that's a description of, your, uh, of the isometry group of, the, of Sol. And um, this should convince you, hopefully, that um, mapping tori <coughs> to 
of uh, Anosov, what's called Anosov uh, endomorphisms, uh, automorphisms. Phi. Uh, of the torus are sol. So what's a mapping torus is you take the torus, cross interval, and you glue the top to the bottom by an, an, uh, an SL2Z identification. And by assumption, SL2, and the, this identification phi is an OSOF, meaning um, two distinct real eigenvalues. Right, so the way to put to realize such a such a quotient, uh, sorry, such such a mapping torus as a quotient of uh, sol space is to uh, rotate the the eigen directions of phi until they coincide with the vertical. Uh, I mean, with the first two axes, the x-axis and the y-axis. Then your your lattice, your, your uh, the z2 by which you quotient r2 to get the torus looks like some sort of weird lattice in the horizontal plane. Right? And uh, it looks exactly the same up here after uh, stretching and, uh, and compressing by, by phi. So uh, that's an example of a, sol, uh, of a manifold, uh, manifold with a sol geometry and theorem. In fact, all sol uh, manifolds, three manifolds, are of this form or quotients thereof. By uh, by groups of order, uh, I think it's at most eight. So really we have a, a good understanding of all three manifolds that do not fall into the last H3 class. So I'm going to spend the remaining time discussing uh, a little bit about the, uh, the remaining geometries, especially nil. But before that, um, another observation. Uh, if you look at the unit tangent bundle of uh, genus G surface, uh, that's also the quotient of uh, the unit tangent bundle of the hyperbolic plane. And this has uh, SL2 twiddle geometry, as we mentioned. SL2 acts on the hyperbolic plane. While uh, here's another circle bundle over the same surface. While uh, Circle cross SG has uh, H2 or in this order R cross H2, H2 cross R. Geometry, and, and these are different geometries. However, if I do this with a surface with boundary, then as mentioned in the theorem, the, 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 the two uh, collapse in a sense, and that's because it's in fact the same bundle. However, um, if I look at the unit tangent bundle of the thrice punctured sphere, and I'm drawing the thrice punctured sphere as a hyperbolic surface, uh, then this is in fact homeomorphic to the trivial tangent bundle sorry, the trivial circle bundle over the same surface because 
so these are homeomorphic and for, for the same reason it has both geometries. And the reason they are homeomorphic is that uh, the trice punctured sphere has a field of directions. So that's a trivialization of the, of the unit tangent bundle. Namely, how do I do this? You take a, uh, well, there are many ways of doing it, but basically you comb singularities of, a, of any field to the, to the punctures. Here's a, I don't know, the, uh, I guess we could do it that way. And if, you, if you can find a field of directions with, and then without singularities on the surface, then that's a trivialization of the tangent bundle. And so the, it doesn't matter if you look at this circle bundle as the trivial or the tangent bundling, so it has both. So that's supposed to take S1 cross the press? S1 cross the surface, yes. Okay. So a, a tangent vector uh, on that surface is a tangent vector on the surface, but it's also given by just go to a point and say how many radians away from the, from the, the orange direction you are. So that's a trivial, just a number at every point. So it's a trivial. Okay, so that's, that, that explains the, the phenomenon here. Now, um, I'm going to say another, not really a classification, but a statement about spherical geometries, because there are some questions about this in the exercise sheet. Um, so S3, in a sense the, the first simplest case, uh, is also famously the double cover of SO3. Uh, the orientation uh, cover of the, the group SO3. Um, the isometry group, or the trivial component of the isometry group of S3 is given by multiplications by unit quaternions on both sides. Namely, uh, you take two unit quaternions, you, you, you view the, the three sphere as the unit sphere in the algebra of quaternions, and the way they, these act on an on a element of S3 is just, for some reason I like to write it like this, B times U times A inverse, so, so that, that gives you a very concrete handle on, on how to, how to um, send the three sphere isometrically to itself. And in fact, uh, for spherical manifolds, gamma under S3, um, yeah, there's an equivalence. Pi 1 of m is a billion, if and only if it's cyclic if and only if it does not contain uh, minus the identity of S3, so the antipodal map, and equivalently it's a lens space. So that's the first class of, uh, of spherical manifolds that there are. And uh, Remaining ones, other spherical three manifolds are quotients of, um, so I can write it S3 modulo plus or minus one. 
let me SO3 by subgroups. So uh, SO3 uh, acting by right and left multiplication as above. Um, by subgroups that have finite index, uh, in fact that have index uh, 1, 2 or 3 uh, in some product group. gamma prime cross gamma second. So you can put a gamma prime in SO3, a gamma second in, in SO3, let their product act by right and left multiplication on SO3. And this will usually have some, some uh, uh, usually not be a free action unless you're in one of those very special situations. Um, uh, because one of them cyclic. So one of the two has to be cyclic and the other one could be uh, an icosahedron group or a tetrahedron group or something. Now there's an exercise that does not really ask you to show this but, but, but some weaker statements in the, in the exercise sheet. And okay, I, I still have some time to draw some pictures of nil geometry which is the only one we don't have pictures for yet. So nil geometry, I'm going to draw it um, to use R3 as the model space. The action on it will not be by affine transformations, it will be by uh, some sort of polynomial transformations. And here's the picture. Um, isometries, well, there's an exact sequence. The good news is you can write 1R, the isometries of nil, a fiber over the isometries of the plane. And you, you view this as acting on R3 with three coordinates, x, y, z. And that acts on R2. And these here are uh, translations along the z-axis. So over here, let me draw. I'm drawing tangent planes at every point. So they are horizontal on the y-axis and as I move along the x-axis they, they start to tilt. They are sort of more vertical. They get more and more vertical as I, as I move to the right. And over here they are more like they, they go down, they flip. And everything is invariant on their, on their z uh, translations. So Above every isometry of R2, there is a um, there is a uh, there's a, an isometry of nil space, and the way it acts. Uh, let let me show you how um, the stabilizer of um, zero in R3 preserves the red quadric. Can I use red? Uh, z equals xy. So that's a quadric that looks something like goes down here, here it goes up, and it goes down on the other side. It, it contains both axes and it's uh, on the positive side when x and y are both the same sign and it's negative the rest of the time. Uh, and yeah, 
it's this saddle. And you have to imagine that the, as you rotate in, uh, in, the, in the projection, you rotate the, the points uh, in, the, in the vertical x-y coordinates, then the vertical lines of nil have to do a little dance by going up and down and up and down along the quadric. So the, this map gets sent to that map by rotation. So sorry, this vertical line to that vertical line to the, to the next. Um, now what can we say? The, um, uh, pi inverse, so if we call this uh, capital pi, I guess, pi inverse of R2 translations is generated by uh, yz translations and uh, x translations composed with a shear uh, Y, Z shears. I guess what I'm trying to say here is, you're allowed to, to translate the whole the whole picture by uh, in the Y Z plane, but if you want to move in, into the X direction, then you have to to push down. You have to to basically send these squares to those squares. Uh, it tilts, so it, it it kind of bends your your space as you go, and you bend more and more as you move to the left. So this description should show, uh, if, if you work it out a little bit carefully, this shows two things. Um, one is that uh, nil can be identified with 1, 1, so the Heisenberg group, I think you have to put it put them this way. So the Heisenberg group, but you have to to, uh, to add things that are not just multiplications in the Heisenberg group. Those are those are these funny rotations that I described. Uh, it shows this and that the one one and zero uh, mapping torus has nil geometry. Right, namely you take you take um, a vertical square here in the y z direction as a fundamental domain for your torus. You can identify opposite sides by translations which are which are in the group. And then you, you, you push this in the x direction and do some shearing. You push it by n units and you can do n shearing with intensity n and that, that gives you a mapping torus uh, with this monodromy. Um, okay, I can stop here. Thank you.